opening. We're underway? Yeah, hold on. Oh, it goes to volume. All right, boom. That's the volume. We're up and running. So this is the first ever Source Points podcast with video. We have both audio and video, so you get this is sort of, you know, add to your uh, interest and viewing pleasure here. And today we've got uh, Jesse Tigner with us, who's joining us from Swamp Donkey Solutions, and uh, it should be an interesting discussion. Jesse, Jesse is doing a project that I'll let him tell you about, and I thought, well, uh, and he wanted to talk to me about that, and, and I thought, well, uh, we could do it the old-fashioned way and just do it and write a report, or we could do a podcast. And uh, so, and then I thought, uh, to add to the degree of difficulty, let's see if we can if we can uh, add video uh, as well to the podcast. Uh, Dr. Chris is actually here, but he's going to be silent and in the background because he's got his mitts full, switching between uh, different cameras and uh, managing the audio and doing all the Dr. Chris stuff. Uh, so with that, uh, Jesse, uh, uh, you've been on previous podcasts, obviously when you were with us here at Explore. Now you're out on your own. Congratulations, that's Thank great. You. And uh, keen to hear what you've been up to, and then we can dive into uh, dive into discussions. Right on. Um, yeah, I'm glad that we were able to do this interview via podcast. I think thus far this project has been quite interesting. So hopefully, your legions of loyal loyal listeners will find it interesting. <laughs> legions as well. of I think it's like <laughs> eighty or something. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. We we do appreciate it. We do appreciate it. Yeah. So good. So. Um, the, this project uh, is, is kind of an interesting one, and it's something that we sort of talked about a little bit here and there, I guess, when, when I was here, uh, so in, in concept form. Um, ultimately, I am an, an ecologist by training, um, so I sort of explain my existence in, in the world of oil and gas as one foot in ecology and one foot in, in sort of seismic operations, I guess. And um, I originally came to Canada to uh, do a master's project looking at um, how animals responded to different kinds of seismic lines, lines at different states of recovery, lines at different widths, and I knew next to nothing about seismic at all. Uh, I'm from the northeast of the U.S. There's really no oil and gas there whatsoever. So everything for me was, was new, uh, and I got quite an education of sort of seismic practices and, and what this whole sort of world meant. Um, and that education, I, I learned as I moved from the ecology and the science world to the seismic and the operations world, with respect to the way seismic practices were conducted was a little bit um, overly simplified. So what I mean by that is, is there's sort of a, a rule of thumb in, in the world of ecology and research that says seismic lines once upon a time were cut with um, cats, and those are conventional wide lines, and then lines were cut with mulchers, and um, the primary reason behind that transition was uh, mulchers would disturb the ground a little bit less, uh, they would disturb the vegetation a little bit less while lines were being cut, and the translation of that was those lines recover very quickly and the cat cut lines, because of the nature of, of the way cats were used to cut lines, those lines recover very slowly, if at all. So you're, you're sort of left with these permanent or semi-permanent, we'll say, disturbances on the landscape that uh, affect a range of ecological values. Once I came onto the seismic operation side of things, it was like, geez, that's not, it's really not that cut and dry. Um, lines are cut differently kind of on every program to some extent. Um, and I started to learn a bit more about the history of, of specifically conventionally cut lines and realized that actually a cat cut line in, say, 1950 was an entirely different operation, was cut very differently using even different equipment than, say, a cat cut line in um, something from the early 90s. So that, that idea sort of percolated in the back of my head a little bit, and when you sort of, when you have a little bit more information on the operational side, and you go back to the ecological side of things, you realize, I think a lot of the um, uncertainty that we have as a research community and, and an industrial community around how lines recover over time probably has to do with that change in historical practices 
and not really capturing those changes on the research side of things. So the idea for this project was, well, let's talk to the folks that have been in the field. Let's see sort of from, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, how practices changed over time. What did a seismic operation look like in the late 40s versus the 60s versus the 80s versus the 2000s? What was done on an operation to prepare these lines for, for geophysical surveys? And see if we can't identify patterns, either patterns in space or patterns in time, that we could then go back to the research with and say, aha, if you're able to sort of compartmentalize data a little bit differently because you have this infusion of knowledge from operations, we may actually start to be able to um, suss out and flesh out a lot of the uncertainty that we have um, with respect to how lines were covering. So that's the, the sort of 50 cent overview of what this project was about. Um, and you have a long history in seismic, even though you're not, I guess, officially an old timer yet. Um, so I thought, you know, you'd, you'd be a great person to, to talk to. Right. That's, that's neat. And you're right. We talked a lot uh, over the years, you and I, about uh, needing more granular data and about the importance of getting the data right so that you could properly measure things and so that you could understand uh, recovery better. And, and my pet peeve at the, at the time was that, you know, cumulative effects calculations didn't ever consider uh, recovery. And whether that recovery was natural or whether it was induced, you know, you've got players out there that are that are putting huge efforts into planting trees and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, I mean, and, and I was also interested in th the other part of this was rather than making arbitrary decisions like mulching is better than cat cutting without actually measuring those outcomes, you know, we can spend a lot of money minimizing our impact on the environment when it may or may not actually be doing the trick, right? If, for example, mulch lines take longer to recover, and we knew that definitively, we might not mulch them. We, we might do fall back to cat cuts. And, and, um, and so those discussions to me are really interesting. And I know that the data, that we don't have the data right yet. I'm really sure of that. And, uh, and it's because it's hard to get our mitts on, and it's hard to properly characterize and, and you know you get these massive data sets of seismic lines in an area and you know yourself uh, they can be very very different uh, depending on orientation how they were cut all that kind of stuff so that's that's exactly right and and to be fair you know it's the the sort of management of of stuff in this case the management of, of um, ecological values is is a complex beast so because of exactly what you're saying, because we don't really have a good handle on data, unfortunately and somewhat surprisingly across most of Western Canada, we don't even have a lot of the lines captured on you know, some sort of geo database. There's a lot of lines that are just sort of orphan floating out there in the world and a researcher may not even know that they're there to study. Uh, and then once you sort of get over that hurdle and you at least have all of these lines together in space in some sort of visual representation, um, we know next to nothing about how or when they were cut in most cases. So again, that translation on the research side of things simply comes out as, ah, I don't know, there's a lot of variability within my data. So it's, it's a neat sort of opportunity to suss some of that out. I, I should also say, um, that this is this project is being generously supported by um, financially by uh, the CAGC. Fantastic. Uh, and it's really also good. being generously supported and, and sort of able to happen through people's generous donation of their time. Um, folks like, well, both of you guys, but, but I've, I've interviewed, I think you're the 31st or 32nd interview now. So lots of really great interviews from a a load of fascinating people so yeah it's great that the CAGC is uh, supporting this uh, you know th those of us who support in turn the CAGC uh, participate and volunteer uh, it's it's exactly the kind of thing the CAGC needs to be doing so that we can have good scientifically sound discussions on the decisions we're making and the actions we're, we're taking going forward so that's uh, you're right. And happy, happy, happy that you pointed that out. Mike does. Mike Doyle, um, uh, you know, does a huge amount of work uh, with the CAGC, and and even through these difficult times, he's working his tail off and doing some good stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah, really good. 
Uh, okay, so then we can kind of get down into the nitty gritty. So I, um, the the flow of, of these interviews, uh, in essence, boils down to a conversation. Um, so I sent everybody, in including you, uh, a list of, uh, I think, 43 questions. Um, most folks are, well, I shouldn't say that. Some folks are able to touch on everything. Some folks are only able to touch on a few. Um, we can keep this pretty loose. Um, I can just sort of start to ask you questions and usually it, it evolves into a bit of a conversation and I'll kind of keep track of this list a little bit. Um, so we'll start with the easy stuff. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your when to when? When did you start in, uh, in the industry and, and what have you done? So it's really, it's, it's interesting. I started, uh, I was a summer student um, that actually I wasn't looking for a job in the industry I received a phone call uh, one summer morning asking me to get on a bus and go to Edson. Uh, and I had to actually back up and ask this person who he was and like have him introduce himself. <laughs> Apparently he'd heard about me, uh, you know, being a tall guy and a strong guy and at, at the time. And, and um, you know, I was in pretty good shape and I had a friend that was working in the industry and he told this guy about me and then the phone call happened. I already had a job, but I decided to quit my job and get on a bus and go to Edson. Uh, I remember asking him, by the way, uh, like, what will I need? And training or, you know, like supplies? He said, ah, just whatever you're wearing should be good. A and classic seismic answer. <laughs> you know, so uh, I at least had the foresight to, to, to wear, uh, you know, hiking boots and camping stuff. Um, anyways, showed up in Edson, and I, I ended up working with a, with a fantastic guy, uh, Mike Cardell, uh, who was really, he became, as time went on, a mentor of mine and a, and a friend and a, and a close friend at that. Uh, Mike is a, was a wonderful man, and, and he later, he later uh, died of, of cancer, tragically, at an at a, at a age that was far too young. So. Uh, but anyway, so that was my start. And I actually— I'm sorry, what year was that? 1988. Okay. So, uh, you know, I mean, actually— pretty close to my 32nd anniversary in the industry. If I think about the time, you know, here we are mid-July, uh, it was maybe a little bit earlier, so a little over 32 years in the industry uh, in all kinds of different roles. I, I remember very distinctively being in Edson in the summer and we were using cats to prep line. And the first time I saw a D6, what, you know, it was a wide pad D6, uh, prepping a line, cutting down trees, mowing down trees. I, it was an astonishing, awe-inspiring sight. And anybody that's seen it will know what I'm talking about. So describe, describe that flow. Like what was it was? What here, was we're on the road, and the cat turns off the road, drives through the ditch, uh, blade down, mowing down trees mm -hmm. in the middle of summer. And uh, straight, straight line, no deviations. Very, very efficient. Very, very good way to to accomplish that objective. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, entirely unacceptable by today's standards, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, but at the time, that was de rigueur. That's how we did it. And um, it was very wet. Uh, in fact, the guy that the reason that I was called out on short notice was that uh, the person I replaced had given himself a hernia because he was waist deep in the mud, mm. and uh, in extracting himself from the mud, had strained his abdomen uh, and was actually an LTI. So. Uh, he, he went home and, and I replaced him and we, we walked down these very wet lines. The, the, all the deployment on that project was happening with uh, Nodwells. Uh, so, uh, you know, FN60s, FN110s, uh, moving down these six to seven meter wide lines uh, with, uh, with jug hounds on the back, throwing off cable and planting strings of 12, if I remember. So then this is what I've heard a few people reference as a, a tracked crew. It was a tracked yeah. crew, okay. yeah. It was actually borderline, it should have been a heliportable crew, actually. We, when Mike and I talked about that program over the years, uh, you know, over the next couple of decades when we were, we were talking, you know, we would always call that the program the heliportable without the helis. Mm. So, because we had large areas where the slope was too extreme, uh, and uh, we had river crossings and all kinds of complexity, and it just, uh, you, you know, we really needed helicopters. So some days we would walk in, uh, you know, eight kilometers. We'd start our survey work, and we'd walk another eight kilometers, and then we'd walk 16 kilometers back to the road. Hmm. And so every day we work, and then eventually we get closer to the next road over, and we'd have to, so it was a, 
it wasn't a well orchestrated project in mm -hmm. retrospect, but uh, but that's that was my intro. Okay, so then you're you're in the field as a, a surveyor for the next. Yeah, survey helper. Uh, but I was a survey helper from you know minimum wage four dollars and fifty cents an hour at the beginning, and then um, uh, just a progression up that uh, kind of discipline through uh, junior surveyor, surveyor. Uh, you know, did I ever get the senior surveyor? I mean, it, not necessarily. Uh, mid '90s uh, moved into. I spent some time. Actually, spent. I'd get called out to drill push on a small project or to. Uh, you know, occasionally I'd stay, I'd stay behind. I, I was homeless for a period of time, so I didn't want to go home, mm -hmm. uh, and so I just wanted to work. And so when the survey crew was done, uh, often I would go and be a jug hound, mm -hmm. and so I'd lay out geophones and do that. Uh, I'd driller helper, uh, do whatever. And so it's and fair to say you got a taste of everything in the field. Got a taste of everything, and then in '94, '95, I guess, right in there. Uh, I was offered a position as an HSE advisor, and uh, that that was a, an important step forward for me. Uh, Schlumberger. So the the company I started with was a company called Sonics Exploration. Sonics was privately owned. Uh, Earl Hale owned it. Uh, he might have had partners as well, but Earl was the was the I think the principal guy there. And he did a great thing. He sold his company to Geco Geophysical, which at the time was just getting bought by Schlumberger, and then Schlumberger ultimately bought. Procla Seismos, a, an old German uh, seismic company. GECO was a Norwegian company, predominantly a marine company. And they put GECO and Procla together to make Schlumberger GECO Procla. It was quite a handle at the time. They went from being Sonics to being Schlumberger GECO Procla. But what was beautiful about that was that Schlumberger uh, instilled all of its values into, the, into that company. And so I could see, uh, even as I was going through the survey uh, discipline, we got all the Schlumberger training. We got Schlumberger training programs, technical training. They had a program called STEP. I forget what it was all about, but through that progression, you know, we could learn and get training, cross-disciplinary training. And I just, th spending the first half of my career with Schlumberger is, I, I owe them a debt of gratitude because it was training unlike anything uh, I could have imagined. And, and equally, going into HSC was really a nice stepping stone to management because you become a wild card. You can go anywhere, do anything, see anybody, ask all kinds of stupid questions. You can learn at a pace that's very rapid and you can have a profoundly positive impact. Uh, health, safety, and environment is central to everything in the industry. And thinking about those things in conjunction with an operation, was a, it was just a wonderful start. Uh, or a wonderful progression, rather, uh, out of survey and, and through and into management. Uh, so that kind of, uh, I stayed with that until I became ultimately the North American HSC manager uh, in 1997, I guess, six, seven, somewhere in there. And then uh, moved to Texas for a time, a couple of years, year and a half, uh, Midland, Texas. But at that time, I was traveling all over. So uh, Alaska, Canada, Texas, Louisiana, um, and, and phenomenally busy time. And then, uh, and we did a number of good things during that period. So uh, we developed, uh, as part of the CAGC HSC committee, we developed uh, and, and changed the blasting regulations for seismic in, in, uh, in BC. Uh, we developed more sophisticated, uh, in the, as part of the committee, there were others, Peter Adams and others, uh, Richard Banner, Peter Adams, we developed uh, improved training protocols for line prep. Uh, that pivot to mulching was happening, and so we started talking about um, minimum, you know, low impact seismic and meandering lines. Um, so, so a lot of things happening. We tested actually near zero impact uh, work uh, in 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 that period as well with our with our NAVPAC technology. And then in 1998, I became the Canada manager, uh, vice president uh, for for Schlumberger Canada Limited, and did that for four years. And during that period, we really aggressively chased the, the NAFPAC and the minimal impact uh, work, and, and uh, especially with heliportable projects. So, uh, and then joined Explore in 2002. Okay, so um, you're you're sort of entering the the industry at a pretty, really a pretty fascinating time because you're sort of 
you're you're starting as the uh, I'm calling it sort of the semi old school because uh, there was a bit of a transition like late forties early 50s to the 60s uh, and then from the kind of mid late 60s through about the mid 80s it was more similar than it was different let's say but by 88 when you entered it's starting to sort of be this period of foment where there's tons of change happening at very rapid succession so I'm, I'm wondering if you could kind of walk me through you said that your your first project there in Edson was was a tracked crew D6 straight line. I'm wondering if you could sort of just compartmentalizing the way lines were cut, if you could kind of walk me through how that changed from that early Edson project through, you know, say, well, through now, really. I mean. Yeah. So th different drivers. So there were, uh, you know, we could see lines that had been cut uh, in years prior to, to us. And we, in, in the late 80s onward, one of the things that was a change that had that had just sort of happened um, prior was it was previously the practice where you would actually, if you were on a side hill, you would actually carve out the side hill. So mm -hmm. you'd actually cut away the side hill to create a more level surface. Well, that had ended. That that I never saw that. Okay, yeah. but um, blade down, no mushroom shoes. You know, there's a you know, there's a big slash pile on the side of the line, and trees are all trees are all arranged. Um, the tearing the carpet up, so to speak. Yeah, like yeah. it was. It was just it, that's what that's more or less what happened. Um, in that early era, we did go to the Arctic several times, and so both on the North Slope and on the um, and in the Mackenzie Delta. So I think my first visit to the Delta was eighty nine or ninety, um, and at that time we were protecting the tundra with mushroom shoes, and it was sort of like you can't touch snow only. Mm -hmm. so, so that protocol was in place up in the up in the Arctic. And so sorry to maybe just jump ahead a little bit. When, give or take, when did that protocol sort of trickle down into the into the boreal and the foothills? I don't know that I ever really saw it uh, get there. Kay. I don't. I don't know that it ever really did. I think Kay. the pivot was really to to mulching and Kay. and to, you know, certainly a, a standard around not gouging. You mm -hmm. know, the, but I don't know that I ever saw mushroom shoes. I'd have to think about that. Um, and then it was interesting, you know, so just different, different stories that come to mind. I remember one survey in, uh, in northern BC when BCWCB started focusing heavily on mitigating danger tree risk. The advice was to use mechanical means to dispense with danger trees, a tree length and a half out from the middle of line. So I was on one project where, or very early days with compliance on that, on that difficult question, we, c th you know, wasn't me that cut it, but our company cut a line that was three tree lengths wide. Yiza. So it happened, and yeah. and it was like, well, why are we doing this? And and well, because we can't have danger trees mm -hmm. within a tree length and a half. W and so that that didn't last. Right. But it, it was a, it was a one off. But I remember seeing uh, seeing that incredible impact. It was basically a clear cut, you know, seismic line. So. Um, yeah, and then it was really broadly speaking, it was in the uh, in the late mid to late '90s where we started pivoting to mulchers. There were some early adopters in that in that space. We also, w before we went to mulchers, there was there was a time frame, uh, mid '90s, early mid '90s, where we would go from a D6 cat to a D5 to a D4, and LAS was about meandering the cat. Mm -hmm. uh, around through the forest, so we we you know typically you'd hand cut a line uh, that was straight, so you'd had a, you had a line of sight. We didn't have GPS being used widely at the time, and then the cat would meander and try to avoid the big trees, as it were, mm -hmm. and and meander back and forth across that hand cut line. A lot of risk with that because of the interaction of the of the fallers and the cat, and making sure you're controlling risk and coordinating that operation, and then. Uh, and then it got to uh, eliminating that with mulching and, and then ultimately tying that in with GPS, which is broadly speaking where, where people are today. Um, in that period as well, we were very busy in the mountains. And so Heliportable had a, had a similar progression of uh, the early Heliportable hand cut lines were, were um, chainsaw cut and they would be two, three meters wide. Um, and then, and really in, 
in the early going, little consideration of danger trees from offline. And then uh, those lines progressively got narrower and just uh, out of a question of efficiency, and it was a case where efficiency and environmental mitigation tie together. And then again, same period of the of sort of that early mid '90s of the focus, strong focus on danger trees. There'd been a number of fatalities um, in the forestry industry, and and I think in our industry as well. And so WCB was ver in BC was very focused on that, which is where a lot of the heliportable uh, work was happening. And uh, and so then that kind of takes us up to present day on that front. Do you remember the first? And maybe it's different north versus south, but do you remember the first uh, program that you used a mulcher on, or a mulcher was used? Yeah, so it was in the Rocky Mountain House area. Um, I know that our company had used them beforehand, but I had just come back from living in Texas, and it was 1998, and uh, we used a, a small company that it was based out of Rocky Mountain House, and they had, had these mulchers, mm -hmm. and, and I think... Uh, Around the same time, the guys at Bear Slashing uh, started buying mulch. It was kind of a thing. We were moving right. in that direction. Yeah, and, right and it wasn't only just not, uh, it wasn't only duff avoidance, minimizing contact with the duff. The other advantage of mulching is that if for the same usable line width, we m eliminate the slash pile. Mm. So uh, that's a big that's a big advantage to mulching because if, if even if you're using a small cat, you end up with trees stacked up along the edge of the line you have to cut a wider line to accommodate the slash pile mm -hmm. so it was to help get the line widths down and you don't have to you know you don't you're not knocking roots over and turning the earth over mm -hmm. fast forward 20 years what we learned was actually turning those roots over might be a good thing in certain mm -hmm. forest types it might accelerate regeneration counterintuitively so um okay so then A, a line, you know, it, we've, we've, I know we've talked about this many times before, but um, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the goal of the seismic industry is, is to cut lines. That's not really at all the goal. The goal is to basically prepare a work surface, prepare access, whatever the case may be, to get subsequent waves of the survey, i.e. equipment and personnel, uh, into an area. So I'm wondering sort of, there is another reason. Go ahead. So it's both a logistics and movement of uh, assets. But in, again, before the onset of GPS, we also needed a line of sight in order to be able to survey efficiently and get get that done. So so it was it was that too, right? right it was line of sight for survey as well as moving equipment down the line. So can you, and, and the answer, Maybe it, it didn't, but can you um, sort of speak to how the consideration of what that work surface would be, i.e. Um, what the actual final prepared footprint along a line would look like relative to what those subsequent waves of, of the operation would be? In other words, if you're by 88, you're probably not staying in bush camps. There's probably sort of enough development around that you're, you're – you know, staying in town or whatever the case may be, but maybe not. So is there sort of consideration to, oh, we've got to drag in a big camp? Or is there consideration of this is going to be a vibe job versus a dynamite job? Or this is a heli-supported program so we can fly bags back and forth versus it's not, and we've got a lot of people moving back and forth. Is there any consideration there of let's, you know, cut the line super smooth, let's do a bunch of backblading to really make this kind of like a, a winter roady kind of feel uh, and then that dissipated or were there really no changes to that capacity very it was situational so w you know um, the quality of the, re the the resulting quality of the line even in 88 was largely a function of the skill of the cat operators and you had very skilled cat operators they'd usually work in tandem you'd have two cat cat skinners that's one thing I never did was was run a cat but uh, they would they would work uh, they would work together, and and a, a, an experienced pairing could a, could a produce a very good line, a uh, very travelable, traversable line, uh, right out of the gates. And if, sorry, if what what does a good line mean? Travelable, traversable. It means you can drive a truck down it um, once it's once it's frozen, Kay. a couple of 
two, three days later, depending on temperatures. Right you could drive a tracked rig down it almost the next day, and, and you right didn't now. have a ton of pokers and a ton of things. And they w that would just be the skill set of them. Now, you would encounter occasionally forest types that just don't let you do that. Right. Okay, you could show the, on the one extreme, giant, huge trees with big root balls and divots in the road, or divots in the, in the line. And the other extreme, of course, is like wetlands uh, that those, those cats have trouble traversing, and mm -hmm. it gets risky to kind of do that at, mm -hmm. certain, at certain times. So, so it was good. And then we would still use back then, I mean, I stayed in uh, cat camps, which were basically sleigh camps, towed small mm -hmm. sleigh camps, you know, two unit, one unit, two unit sleigh camps with an integrated kitchen, small team of people. That mm -hmm. still was it still was happening and might still again if you get back up north. Um, and then uh, and then it, it would just be a range. It would depend 2D, 3D, close to town, far away from town, remote. You know, um, all of those variables. Mm -hmm. If we were uh, if we had the budget and there was a reason to do it, we would often get uh, skitters to come in uh, and run a drag to smooth the line out, compact the line, you know, spread the snow, uh, plow the snow, spread the snow, pack the snow uh, in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. uh, that was much less common in the, in the summertime. I don't, know, I don't know if we ever ran a skitter in the summertime. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think so. So, in, and obviously there's going to be a seasonal difference as well, but... Um, were there, like, once the line was prepped, was there lots or any sort of rutting or breaking through of the actual duff or soil or anything like that? Or, you know, and that... All the time. All the time. All the time. Like, you know, y you could you could see the difference. Today, most seismic uh, operations can rent a truck from a fleet management service because there's really just very little specialties, specialization required overall. Back in the day, every truck had skid plates on the bottom, huge bush guard on the front, a giant, you know, a worn 9,000 pound worn winch was a standard uh, bit of equipment because you're going to need it mm -hmm. like all the time. Okay. And uh, we would, you know, we I could we could go on for hours with stories of people getting stuck and multiple vehicles getting stuck and mm -hmm. people getting stuck pulling the stuck guys out mm -hmm. and cats getting stuck pulling the stuck. On and on it goes. Vibrators breaking through uh, and sinking over the, you know. On one project, I remember very distinctly in the Hinton area in, the, in, in late winter, really early spring, we turned a 60,000 pound Mertz 18 into a submarine. And uh, <laughs> that, that was an expensive and interesting proposition, getting that out of the, uh, out of the wetlands that it, right that it had broken into, so broken through to. So by the time I was on my first seismic job, which was 2010, I think, or 2011, I can't remember. Um, breaking through was not a common thing. It happened sometimes. Um, what what changed, like, over, over that sort of decade and a half, two decades? Interesting. Um, a real, a, a, you know, a very seasonal operation. Uh, a real strong tendency to go to winter operations, uh, a less year-round thing, less work on the margins of that. Uh, generally, l generally equipment that was a little bit lighter, I guess. Um, that's an interesting observation. Uh, where, where you were in Liard for that stuff, right? Mostly. Uh, Central Mackenzie. Central Mackenzie. Ah, Central Mackenzie. Arctic, subarctic, very cold, and we actually did break through there. We had two, we times, we yeah. uh, in in those years, sort of two thousand five to two thousand, we sunk a couple cats. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was less common because we're in the guts of winter and it's truly forty below. Mm -hmm. It's truly frozen, and you're managing your way through. It's subarctic, so yeah. it's okay. you, know, you have actual permafrost. Yeah. Right, uh, you've got a variable permafrost layer, but it's not as dynamic as, let's say, if you were west of Drayton Valley or you were in the Edson area. There's no permafrost there, right. and it may not freeze. In fact, right. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so, sorry, I'm just looking at my questions here. Yeah, I should. I 
you sent it to me, but I oh no, all good, all good. Um, so we touched on a lot of these. Um, one thing that I I hadn't really thought about until I started interviewing folks was um, I've heard a lot of a lot of variability around um, how an operation unfolds after the line is cut. So from an, from an ecological perspective, uh, a line is cut and some amount of, of damage is done to the ground and that may in the future um, either facilitate or prevent recovery. Uh, much less is, is given to what happens on that line after the line is cut, much less attention is given there. So one thing that I didn't really think about uh, until I started interviewing folks was how much that changed. Um, so, you know, in the old in the old times, crews were very small. Operations were quite streamlined. Um, people talked about sort of single pass operations. Then, at some point in time, um, recording density got much higher. Crews were much bigger, and we sort of the industry kind of changed to some respect from organized, streamlined single pass operations to Benny Hill and Yakety Sacks out there, and lots of toing and froing along lines, um, for better or for worse. And then, sort of, a heli assist program came online with the advent of, of bag runners. And um, that sort of dramatically reduced the amount of traffic along a line. I'm, I'm wondering if you could sort of speak to that, um, what your experience is in that capacity. What right. did you see? So uh, one of the great things about, about my career and, and probably many careers in the, in the business is I had these wonderful mentors. And so one of, one of mine, and again, he's passed away as well, was Warner Lovell. And so Warner looked after Western Geophysical in the 50s and 60s, and you know, he, he was instrumental in the 70s uh, through, that p through that period. He, he started his career. And back then, you, you would, would travel, travel around with your family. family. So the doodle buggers. The true doodle buggers. And... Um, and it was a, a sort of a mobile crew, and you're right to say they were small crews. You, know, you might you might have uh, like you know 24, 20, 24 re receivers on a you know 24 geophones on a crew. You might 12, 24, 48, 96. It kind of went in that direction, mostly analog systems. And so the first big shift that you're talking about is the advent of digital uh, digital systems. The big shift that was happening right when I started was uh, digital telemetry. So you could actually uh, get uh, data about the quality of the geophones in real time. You could say, okay, this geophone is noisy or leaky or uh, upside down or whatever. Um, and so digital telemetry was huge. It also allowed you to turn on, to have much larger spreads. So that, you know, the IO system one and the IO system two were some of the early digital, system, digital telemetry systems. And so you could move the active spread. So you could lay out a lot more equipment than you needed. And you, you still physically had to roll back to front, uh, but you could move the spread to accommodate multiple shooters. And that started, even on a 2D spread, and that started driving channel counts up. At the same time, uh, in the mid-'80s, kind of you know, a few years before I started, people were starting to think they've sort of progressed from uh, 2D to very densely acquired 2Ds and swath shoots to ultimately 3D seismic. And, um, and so the onset of 3D seismic caused channel counts to grow uh, exponentially. And uh, there's actually some uh, great papers very recently. Uh, Ted Manning at BP has written a really, a really nice paper summarizing that. He's got a log scale chart that shows the growth of channel counts over the decades. Um, and then, yeah, 3Ds just continually got bigger and denser, and and uh, and that changed the outlook and the size of the crew and the way you manage the crew. Um, and and the other thing that changed right during that period, the early 90s, 92, 91, 92, uh, was the onset of GPS, real-time differential first, and then real-time kinematic later. Um, heliportable. There were always there were heliportable crews going back a long way. Uh, heliportable drilling didn't really get sophisticated again until the 80s. Um, and even even then, I would say it stalled out with kind of a dominant design of a two or three pick heli rig mm -hmm. and 
89, 90, something like that. I, I could still think I could go a lot further. Um, but in the early days, they it was polter shooting. And so we we still... I'm sorry, polter shooting is uh, the explosive above the ground? Correct. So there you'd have, a f you know, a, I think a 25-pound or a 50-pound bag of, of explosives on a lath, um, you know, sitting about a meter above the ground, and then you just stand back and uh, we'll detonate this thing because the drilling was, there was no uh, portable, you know, efficient portable air hammer drilling mm -hmm. uh, for that Rocky Mountain kind of thrust belt, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, you know, seismic. So uh, so anyway, yeah, that, that all was kind of a, a moving piece. The thing you mentioned about heli assist recording crews. So up until, uh, again, about 1990, in fact, I know it was 1990 because we we own the data today that uh, that this this happened on. Uh, the only time you'd heli assist recording was terrain driven. So if you physically couldn't m get tracks or line line tracks up the line because mm -hmm. it was too steep, let's say in the foothills or the mountains, then you would go portable, mm -hmm. and you'd go portable with you know drag outs and hand portable until the logistics of that were too great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, drag outs and hand portable common across mm -hmm. a creek crossing, a river crossing, whatever. But as you got into the mountains and you needed to do that over 10 or 20 or 30 kilometers, now you need a helicopter to move mm -hmm. this heavy cables and heavy equipment that, uh, that we had. So that was really the driver. But it was actually Veritas, um, you know, guys like Craig w Rothwell and, and uh, and Doug Wasmuth and those guys, they had the insight in 1989, 1990, that actually, you know, why couldn't we apply the heliportable deployment method even if we don't technically need helicopters to move the gear? And wouldn't that be quicker, they thought. And they tested that theory, and it was a dramatic improvement. In, and so the cost, of the, what they found was that the cost of the helicopter paid for itself because you weren't getting trucks stuck in the muck Mm -hmm. You weren't, you, you didn't have to deal with detours and all that business. And so uh, the crew would just be on foot all day and they would get to the next heli bag and they'd, they'd just move along very efficiently. And mm -hmm. so that, that might be another reason that you don't see people getting as stuck, stuck as often mm -hmm. is because even when it's not needed, technically you could drive a vehicle down. Uh, even in farmers' fields today, mm -hmm. most crews will use a helicopter to deploy large amounts of, mm -hmm. of equipment. And so it's, it's another answer to that question. And that, mm -hmm. that happened in 1990, and, and I think full credit goes to the guys at Veritas for, for that innovation. Once they did it, in, at first it's like anything. You say, those guys are crazy. It'll never mm -hmm. work. Yep, it worked, and everybody else copied it. Right on. Right on. So, I mean, you, you sort of said it, but just for, for clarity, fair to say that once that method kind of came online, the result on the operation was there's just a lot less traffic along the line, motorized traffic. There's foot traffic, but you don't have guys lumping gear as much. Yeah, you're down to troubleshooting vehicles, shooting trucks, and, and then there was a general movement to uh, ATVs as well. Like right so the job that I talked about earlier starting on, we, we ultimately ended up using uh, trikes um, no kidding. Um, to move around, and so I got to wrap my knee around those the rear wheels on a trike a few times. Uh, <laughs> Once is enough. Uh, and then and then quads were like a new thing back then, you mm -hmm. know. So I I spent the summer riding trikes and got pretty good at it. Uh, you know, I, they were they were bloody dangerous though. I had the handlebars come off on me one time in mid. <laughs> I think it was in <laughs> third gear, and the handlebars just came off. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, and then and then quads came around, and and now most of the, well, we haven't used quads since uh, since forever. But uh, I think a lot of guys are you know we're using UTVs now. So that all of that equipment availability changed things as well. Mm -hmm. and, and we found that a shooter on a quad, you know, at first on a trike, and then on a quad was quicker than a shooter in a truck. And mm -hmm. you know, surveyors on quads. I, when I was surveying, I ride a quad twelve hours a day, kind of thing. Right. right, that's quicker than being in a truck. Right, and so the, all of those things change right change the dynamic. Right, right on. Um, okay, so we I, we kind of already touched on this, but I there's kind of one 
one little orphan question here. So in, in terms of um, line maintenance, wasn't really done in the summer, uh, was done if you had budget on, on programs um, in the winter. I, I'm wondering if you could speak to um, kind of where on a program maintenance, line maintenance was done. What, what I mean by that is I've, I've heard um, a quite a range of, of answers from um, everywhere to nowhere. Lines. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm trying to get at. That yeah. All of those are true. Kay. So it was very situational, and it was it was again it was a function of uh, time, planning, budget, uh, the the perspective of the company and the supervisor looking after the project, the perspective of the project manager. What we've seen over and over again is that actually planning and investing in efficiency pays dividends but mm -hmm. that that's not clear to everybody so sometimes yeah. it's like no we're not gonna we're gonna save our money and we're not gonna drag these lines and you kind of think to yourself and instead we're gonna get stuck all the time right. and we're gonna bounce around at about a, an eighth of the speed yeah. right and so th but there's always other reasons you know we didn't start soon enough the, you know the timeline didn't allow for it couldn't get a hold of one you know what you Fair know, there's all kinds of different variables typically though uh, a, a good operation would drag at a minimum the primary spine lines on a 3d the primary access into a project in the main lines and and then the returns on that investment shrink as you get to the end of a line that people are only going to go down once yeah. and it's a dead end and why would we bother with that right so it's kind of a um, all of those possibilities are there, and okay. and there, I don't know how you would uh, set about documenting whether we ran drags up and down the line to compact them uh, without looking at each individual project and the time tickets and the and the I mean you're going that granularity is going to be cut. tough yeah okay for sure but you could probably look at a set of lines on a let's say a 3D or a set of you know a, a a, a 2D project, mm -hmm. and you could wonder why one of those lines wasn't regenerating, and then it might be a reasonable hypothesis to say that well, that it must have drugged that one, yeah. or something else happened there. Yeah, it. I mean, it. But, it, but exactly, it's that. like not science at that point, right? Or it's well, I, I don't know. It's maybe a. It would be a very interesting hypothesis. It would be very hard to execute on, though. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, but okay, that's that's sort of what I was. That's exactly what I was asking. Yeah. So, um, sort of switching gears here. I have a, a couple more clusters of. I'm getting a sign from Chris. Chris. 44 minutes. We're 44 okay. minutes deep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, th we might go long. Is there a limit? Is there a practical limit? Okay, we can Usually I'm running about an hour. Yeah, so I don't mind if we go over, but yeah. our well, we may lose the listeners. <laughs> 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 That's Chris's uh, caution, I think, is that uh, our experience is 45 minutes. Is but Well, now the really this is exciting now about, stuff is going to yeah, happen. Stay so. tuned. <laughs> 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 I probably um, looked at the wrong camera, did I? That's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, then let's switch gears a little bit. So um, could you talk about sort of can you talk about how over your your experience in the industry kind of how the business model has changed and and how that's translated to the way lines are cut the way data are acquired like what l l let me back up a little bit when I talk to the folks that started in the late 40s and the 50s it was a whole different world oil companies had dedicated crews People were working hourly. Um, somewhere along the way, that stopped, and um, people were putting out bids. Some of those were hourly. Somewhere along the line, that stopped. People were going to turnkey. At each of those industry transitions, a commonality that people sort of point to is that, and that had some effect on the way we were doing things in the field. I'm, I'm wondering if you could sort of speak to that. Yeah, so you're right. So when I, um, w one of my favorite op, well, it, 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 I can tell you, in the early part of my career, my favorite operation to be a part of was the were the shell operations. 
because Shell had a legacy of having company crews, and many of those employees stayed with Shell to manage the uh, contracted operation once Shell stopped with the company crews. Those people were uh, very, very good at what they did, by and large. And uh, I learned a ton from them. And, and in terms of their insistence on quality, the kind of standards they set for HSE, uh, the way they planned and ran those programs, you know, you could you could basically watch that and go to school on it. Mm -hmm. And so, so I never, uh, I, I was just past where, I mean, there might have been a few straggler E&P companies that had company crews, but I never really experienced that directly. I think, sh I think right in there, Chevron still had a crew that was an Arctic crew mm -hmm. uh, in the central Mackenzie. They were still, they were up there, and I mean, some of that kit is actually still, still up there. In the shop, in the yard that you and I have walked around mm -hmm. and wondered about. Uh, so, so that that experience of attention to detail, planning, the stability that's offered by that scenario of a of a company, uh, of an EMP company backing that operation up, has become a thing of the past. And equally, the uh, the competency and rigor that was applied by those experienced people working for an E&P company has also largely gone by the wayside. There are exceptions. There are some companies that continue to have good geophysical operations expertise, but most companies don't. Mm -hmm. Most companies don't have that. And so they rely on, on contractors. Um, the, the other thing that, that kind of changed, when, when I started with Sonics, we Sonics had their own survey crew. They had their own recording crew, obviously. They had their own drills. They had their own vibrators, air guns, but drills. So you think about drills. And, um, and so th it was a more vertically integrated operation, right? While the knock, the management MBA kind of knock against vertical integration is that you're kind of not as good at any one of those things as you could be. But equally, one of the things to be good at is the coordination of those different things and, and timing those up. And, and so what's happened today is, and, and in, in corporate and in strategy theory and in, in um, business strategy, there's this kind of, uh, there's a hypothesis around the propensity of industries to integrate. So think Apple, right? Integrated, uh, we've got the apps, we've got the, the whole ecosystem is ours and disintegrate, think Dell, right? So it's IBM, Dell, Apple. It's kind of a, a loop you could mm -hmm. run on that. Right now, w the industry is largely completely disintegrated. Everybody does their own piece of it, and then there are companies, we're one of them, who will uh, put that together and acquire data, uh, largely for our own account, but also for others. And so, so to not to put words in your mouth, but are you basically saying there's you know, the, the way it flows now is there's a front-end company that will kind of manage all of the disparate pieces of what goes into acquiring data and then acquire those data and then in some capacity sell them or lease them back to a company, yeah, a well an E&P. So the, the word front-end company is an interesting one. So you're right, that, that happens a lot. Uh, front-end in, in, in seismic refers to everything before recording. You know, and so managing all that front end stuff, because what happened was the, the vision was, and it happened when I was at, at uh, Schlumberger as well, was the vision was, well, what's our core business? It's recording, right? But the interesting thing is that even back then, especially on a Hello Portable project, the lion's share of the cost was in the front end. It was prepping the lines, cutting the lines, survey, drilling, all of that. And on a heli drilling project, it could even be 80% of the cost. This happens before the recording crew gets there. But uh, from the geophysicist's perspective, that's all, that's all, you know. Other. Other, right? The important part, the part we're concerned with and everything we're doing is around getting the data, right? All that other stuff is just the stuff we need to do to get the data. And so what, what I think uh, happened, again, is you had this, this, these front end guys who would handle approvals and then they'd say, well, I'm handling the approvals. Why don't I also just, I'll take care of the survey. And then, well, I, you know. Sure, we can handle the drilling as well. And so that kind of disintegration happened. 
Um, and, and, you know, it, what changed was there was generally less holistic thought around how, how everything fits together and how to be efficient around that. And, and so we've been, uh, we've been playing in that space. But, but from, a line, from a line preparation perspective, it induced a disconnect between line prep and recording. Because if, if your motivation is not tied to the efficiency and success of the recording operation, but rather the efficiency particularly, and there are many cases of this where, where you know, uh, companies get paid to prepare the lines, they don't get penalized if the recording crew slowed down, recording crew shows up and the lines aren't prepared as they need them to be prepared. Right? I, and they could be over-prepared equally, right? You know, unnecessarily wide lines, for example, or uh, on the other end of the spectrum, not enough access or a missing creek crossing. All of that happened, right? And there was a period, and still happens less often, but there, were a peri there was a period when things were busy, uh, companies would prep a line and the recording crew would get told to pick up the package in the hotel when they, in the motel when they showed up. And uh, so there's almost no, in those situations, almost no coordination between different aspects of the operation. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when times are busy, that could be price of oil or gas is high, there's a land sale coming up, what, is, that, is that what you mean? Yeah, I meant, yeah, when, uh, when you have a robust market. We, when we, uh, when I get back in the day, uh, we would have the Explo Explosives Limited uh, would have a list, and it would be a crew list, and there could be 60 crews on that list. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a bit of a marketing exercise, but it was intel of sorts, yeah, yeah. kind of like the Baker Hughes drilling list in the U.S. now, or the, or the right. rig count that the DOB puts out, explosives put out the crew list. And we'd look for it every week to see were there more crews, less crews. Oh, you know, we'd say Gale Horizon's got two crews, or Petty right. Ray's got three crews, or Sonics has four, or West, you know, Veritas has however. It was, and you had all kinds of different companies, all kinds of different uh, approaches to the business, and, and, um, and it was radically different than what we've got today with you know, three companies hanging on for dear life in the recording space. <laughs> right. Um, okay. The one. So I don't know if that answered your question. You're, it's sort of like turnkey hourly, and the, the the logic with turnkey is, oh well, if it's turnkey, people are motivated to go quick, and then the job isn't as good. I would argue it's actually in that case more about supervision. Mm -hmm. I think either model can work. It's just about setting up a standard that is met. And, and uh, carelessness will generate a poor outcome in either case. Right. Kind of what that would say. Right on. Right on. Um, so then the last the last question that I wanted to ask. I think it's the last one. Let me just take two seconds here. So. the the notion of reopening lines or, or reusing existing lines um, that that was sort of well established by the time you personally got into the industry um, I've heard a range of different sort of reasons why I've heard a range of different experiences on on reusing existing lines I'm wondering if you could speak to two points in particular one is um, on a given program, what was the proportion of line that was reopened versus um, newly cut? And two, um, what, what was your sort of experience with working along reopened lines? Mm. So uh, it's a good question. It, again, it's like s everything, and you know this, it's like everything in the industry, it really depends where you are, mm -hmm. right? So um, in, in, uh, in, a, in the heliportable stuff, almost never mm -hmm. using existing, it was like a massive treat if you ever found an existing line that you could make use of. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it happened, um, and oftentimes the existing lines were highly, and this is well known as well, highly problematic if you have that rapid growth of willows and smaller trees it can actually be far more difficult to traverse and prepare even an existing line than a than a um, than a brand new one because the undergrowth is 
the understory is completely different. So certain how, how does types. a program sort of deal with that? You just grin and bear it? You zigzag around it? Or well, there's sort of this, this well-intentioned mandate from the regulators to use existing lines within a certain distance of, an, of, of your planned line if, if it's there. And, and um, you know, again, uh, if I think back 30 years, our scouting, you know, we would get aerial photographs. We would get topo maps. And the topo maps would sometimes have dashed lines that, you know, they could see from air photos when they made the topos. We didn't get LIDAR. We didn't get, uh, we certainly didn't get photogrammetry from drones or, you know, low-flying aircraft, that kind of thing. Uh, satellite imagery? No, not, not back then. So, um, you know, the ability to plan around existing lines wasn't quite what it is today. And the ability to analyze regrowth on existing lines with, you know, subtracting full feature light or bare earth from full feature lidar and you get the tree height and the canopy mm -hmm. height uh, that wasn't that wasn't done either so it was more it was more haphazard it was m it was more difficult to respond to that regulatory imperative uh, i would say than it is today when we can have a more intelligent conversation we have access to better data we understand forest types better we understand regeneration better and then we can make better decisions about about using existing existing lines or not um, I will say too that one of the most frustrating experiences as a surveyor is coming in to survey a, a, a project and you find that a lot of the access and, and portions of the program have been rolled back. So uh, forestry would, and would occasionally mandate that the slash pile to prevent further access and I would think help the concept was to minimize the impact of the line, you'd have to roll back the slash pile mm -hmm. and it just creates a massive impossible mess to, mm -hmm. to cross very effective way of preventing travel uh, so that was a practice and if you're going to have to reuse an existing line that was rolled back it's going to be something else right. um, so there's there's situations like like that I would say mm -hmm. um, you know so, so we've always done it and the reason is because if an existing line's there to be used, it's cheaper, mm -hmm. it's faster. It's gonna reduce, it all, in most cases, it's gonna reduce risk until that regeneration has hit a certain point. And then probably both for ecological reasons and for efficiency reasons, why would you wanna bother with that? Mm -hmm. You'd be better off cutting a line, mm -hmm. a new line, even though aesthetically it might not look right. Uh, It'd be what you'd do. Right on. Yeah. So, yeah. But now we're really working at not cutting lines at all, uh, mm -hmm. as, as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, there's a, th there's a nice trajectory there with innovation and some of the things we're working on to, to get rid of lines altogether. I think we can do it in a lot of the boreal, not everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, not completely everywhere, but we can massively reduce. Uh, right now, today, we can massively reduce the impact, even from what it is. Uh, mm -hmm today. Uh, remember, too, I, I talked about surveying. The other reason that we needed lines to be cut fairly straight back in the day uh, was cabled systems. Mm -hmm. So you're actually stringing a cable down the line. Uh, today, we don't, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you, know, you don't need lines for the recording system, but you needed lines for the recording system without question. You needed lines for, for that back then. And they couldn't be too, I mean, I, I, again, memories, it's funny to talk about, it comes back. I remember uh, lots of programs where you would say, okay, our takeouts are at, you know, whatever they were, 70 meter takeouts. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'd have a 60 meter recording interval. And then all of a sudden we bring in LIS and the cable's meandering too much mm -hmm. and we, we can't hit can't the spacing. Fit, yeah. We can't can't stretch the cable along this meandering line enough. Right. Big problem. Right. Big big logistical problem. So, uh, so it's it's really three reasons. It's the it's the cable. It's the it's the survey, and it's actually getting the stuff you need to do the work up and down the line. And all of those things are gone. Um, the survey is real time GPS. We can you know under canopies well documented in most Canadian forest types anyway. Works well. Uh, the nodes actually can position themselves at all but the finest scales. Um, we have sources that are lighter and nimbler, our own uh, pinpoint being one of them. 
there are others under development. Uh, the vibrators are smaller than they used to be. Um, we've proven that you don't need the big heavies in, in most cases. Uh, still some work to do on that. So everything's changed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that means we should be rethinking how we prep lines. And, mm -hmm. and, and I would say that in, you know, rather than, or in addition to, but probably before, focusing too hard on accelerating recovery of lines that are still cut to an old standard, focus really ought to go to, hey, you know, we can cut our impact, we can reduce our impact by a third or half out of the gates right, right now. And, and, and companies could do it, but in many cases aren't taking advantage of those new technologies. They're slow to adopt right. uh, the things that, that, for example, we've talked about and others have. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to, to sort of look at that, that technological development vis-a-vis -vis the adoption of that tech within the industry. And it's kind of that adage of whatever that adage is, the, the days are long, but the years are fast, something like that. Yeah, okay, yeah. And you know, it's there was about a ten year, about a ten year period between um, when the first mulcher, or in that case, a hydroax, came online, between then and when there were no cats on programs anymore at all. Not even like the random tow cat, or I suppose there's still a tow cat or a plow cat, but you know what I'm getting at. And and that that advance over the 65 years of interviews that I've sort of run has been quite fascinating. You know, the, the first folks were using giant V8s, uh, although a D8 in the 40s was very different from a D8 now, but a, a giant D8 with a ripper claw on the back literally cutting a road, um, which would later be adopted into a gravel township or range road in, in many cases, and, and literally developing film in a mobile dark room. Um, at a at a seismic camp, all the way through to what you're just talking about now, and it's quite, it's quite. Um, yeah, today we don't even have a recorder. Right. There's no there's no real reason to have one. Mm -hmm. And it's it's such a fascinating, sort of historical advance of of seismic operations, and when you when you kind of pair that operational history to the, the impact, it gets the ecological impact. It gets precisely at that point of. Well, the tech is available to us now, so there is a very real opportunity to sort of, at least in some cases, transition the discussion of how are we going to recover this to, well, let's just not incur the disturbance at all to begin with. So it's kind yeah. of a, it's a well neat time uh, within seismic, for sure. That's right, and, what, and you know this. Like, what's bothered me is if you have a way of reducing your impact, let's say, by half, but you decide not to do that, because it's inconvenient or you got to learn new things or try new things. And then you instead focus on trying to get that recovered when at the same time you're also trying to get lines to be much more dense so that you can get better sampling and better data quality and take advantage of modern tech. You're on a treadmill that you'll never catch up to yourself on. You're, you're, you know, the industry will be cutting, even in its reduced state, will be cutting more kilometers of new line than, get, than it can possibly hope to repair. And so. I think, you know, and I think we've talked about this as well, but I think, man, that's what's, that's what's got to happen is we got to, we've got to stop, stop cutting unnecessary lines right. uh, and start, continue to challenge our, instead of looking back at how far we've come, look forward to how much more there still is to do. Mm -hmm. And, and we can be, we can be satisfied. I mean, what I saw that first week that I was in the field of a D6 mowing down trees in the summertime is gone mm -hmm. and that's 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 great that's great but that was 32 years ago mm -hmm. and so there's lots of other things that have changed and gotten better in 32 years there's still more to do and that's to me that's what we gotta that's what we gotta focus on yeah right on um okay well that's i very much appreciate the conversation do you have a, a burning itch to talk about anything else on a seismic op that's changed <laughs> that i didn't think to ask or no just that just that if you look at uh if you know i'm excited if you look at manning's ted manning's log scale and, and I, he published it with others so i'm forgetting the other authors but uh, in last year's seg um you know that's a if, if you plot it if you plot trace densities on a log scale we're headed to a billion traces we're headed to 
uh, and this has been published by you know, Jack Busca and the guys at BP and, and others, we're headed to a million channel crew, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna see another massive change. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, and uh, that's, you know, that's gonna demand new ways of moving around the landscape mm -hmm. and new technologies to do that. Uh, so it's as tough as things are and as difficult as it is for people to see the future today, because all of us are cash constrained. All of us are, you know, fighting and, and working our tails off to, to keep our heads above water. Uh, I have every confidence that, that we as an industry will get there and that people will apply their skill sets in new ways, even though we don't do this, this, the same things that we used to. Mm. And, and uh, and equally, you might have some people that just don't make the transition. You know, I remember when we went from uh, theodolites to GPS. Some some guys just just left the industry. They didn't want to learn GPS and all this newfangled computer and electronics. It wasn't for them, and they went and they're perhaps they're surveying roads or you know volumetrics on a on a civil project or something. Mm -hmm. They're doing something else. It, it wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. That'll happen too. But uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to see what happens, and it and I, uh, what you're doing, and what Mike and the guys at the CAGC are supporting is fantastic because, oftentimes we forget how we got here, mm -hmm. and why we do what we do, and how it all happened, and and getting some documentation of that is very very important. Yeah, yeah, it's been great to, to interview folks too because it's a whole different beast than just having to read it, you know, yeah. be able to listen to it. Then you got to distill everything and figure out, okay, his dates are off on that, and he didn't, you know. You know, remarkably, folks are pretty bang on. Like, everybody, well, my memory is super fuzzy, but for the most part, everybody's memory is we're hitting, like, within a few years of one another, which is pretty fascinating because it's, I mean, there's clearly a, a temporal pattern that, that right. is identifiable. Well, and some companies got there earlier, you yeah. know. And some, some regions, like you were saying at the beginning, the the Arctic had the sort of snow only contact before the south. Right. So well and the and then the problem with the Arctic as you'll remember is you know even in 2011 12 we're still cutting lines with cats mm -hmm. because we have to tow a sleigh camp because there is no road or town or anything. Right. And so we you know we had we were trying to solve that problem too. That's a that's a whole nother piece mm -hmm. when you get into that kind of frontier setting mm -hmm. right? and I think there's actually opportunity to learn from other countries how they you know how do they do it in Russia how do how do we do things in you know in South America and in other parts of the world I think there's Very lots differently lots to learn there too and and vice versa they can learn from us we can learn from them so you should write a book you know, now you got to write a book it, it'll sell yeah. to exactly <laughs> 28 people yeah <laughs> but Cost ten thousand dollars per copy. <laughs> yeah, I'd pay it. I might pay it actually. But yeah, that's good. Really good. Yeah. Cool. Well, appreciate it. Thanks. Good. We didn't talk movies. It was all biz today. All biz. All biz. We didn't talk movies. We didn't talk politics. We'll avoid that. Uh, everybody's had enough of that lately. And so with that, Chris, guide us. What do we do? I got to hit this thing in outro. And uh, he's giving me the thumbs up. And. Uh, Let's see where we go. I th I'll just do this. Okay. So this has been Source Points Podcast. And is it playing? There we are. Source Points Podcast. My guest, Jesse Tigner, Swamp Donkey Solutions. I'm Alan Chatney with Explore. And if you've stuck it through this long, we appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> come back. We're going to do it again. And stay safe.